ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮರನ್ನಸಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮುದಿತ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತ ನರಂ ಚೈವ ನರೋತ್ತಮ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವ್ಯಾಸ ತಥೋಜ್ಜಾಯಂ ಉದೀರಯ ರೀನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಟೆಂತ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಥೋ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ ಸ he vasudev bibrat carried parusham pertaining to the supreme person dhama the spiritual effulgence brajmana illuminating yata as ravi the sunshine durasada very difficult even to look at difficult to understand by sensory perception ati dur darshaha approachable with great difficulty bhutanam of all living entities sambhuva so he became so he became ha, ha. Positively. positively sabibrat paurusham thama brajamano yatharavihi durasado ti dur darsho bhutanam sambhuvah sabhibrat paurusham thama brajamano yatharavihi brajamano yatharavihi durasado ti durdarsho bhutanam sambhuvah translation while carrying the form of the supreme personality of god within the core of his heart Vasudev bore the Lord's transcendently illuminating effulgence and thus he became as bright as the sun. He was therefore very difficult to see or approach through sensory perception. Indeed he was unapproachable and unperceivable even for such formidable men as Kamsa and not only for Kamsa but for all living entities. Let's say together. while carrying the form of the supreme personality of godhead within the core of his heart vasudev bore the lord's transcendently illuminating effulgence and thus he became as bright as the sun he was therefore very difficult to see or approach through sensory perception indeed he was unapproachable and unperceivable even for such formidable men as kamsa and not only for kamsa but for all living entities purport by his divine grace shila propad the word dhamma is significant dhamma refers to the place where the supreme personality of god resides in the beginning of shrimad bhagavatam 111 it is said dhamna swena sada nirasta kokam satyam param dhimahi in the abode of the supreme personality of god there is no influence of material energy dhamna swena sada nirasta kukham any place where the supreme personality of god is present by his name form qualities or paraphernalia immediately becomes a dhamma for example we speak of vrindavana dham dwaraka dham and mathura dham because in these places the name fame qualities and paraphernalia of the supreme godhead are always present Similarly if one is empowered by the supreme personality of god to do something the core of his heart bec- becomes a dhamma and thus he becomes so extraordinarily powerful not only his enemies but also people in general are astonished to see to observe his activities because he is unapproachable his enemies are simply struck with wonder 
as explained here by the words Durasado ti dur darsha. The words Parusham Dhamma have been explained by various Acharyas. Sri Vira Raghava Acharya says that these words refer to the effulgence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vijaya Dvaj says that they signify Vishnu Tejas. And Shukadev says Bhagavat Swarupa. The Vaishnav Toshini says that these words indicate the influence of the Supreme Lord's effulgence. And Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says that they signify the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then backing up one verse to 16. Bhagavan api vishvatma Bhaktanam abhyat abha yankara Abhiveshamsha bhagina Mana anna kat Mana anka dud Mana anaka dundube Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Api, also. Vishvatma, the Super Soul of all living entities. Bhaktanam, of his devotees. Abhayam kara, always killing the causes of fear. Avivesha Avivesha. entered Entered. Angshabhagena with all of his potential opulences Shud Aishwarya Puruna Mana Mana. in the mind mind. Anakadundube of Vasudev Thus the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is the super soul of all living entities and who vanquishes all the fear of his devotees entered the mind of Vasudev in full opulence. And the next verse says, while carrying the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead within the core of his heart, Vasudev bore the Lord's transcendentally illuminating effulgence and thus he became as bright as the sun. He was therefore very difficult to see or approach through sensory perception. Indeed, he was unapproachable and unperceivable, even for such formidable men as Kamsa, and not only for Kamsa, but for all living entities. Purport to verse 16. Sorry if this seems confusing, but it's all Bhagavatam. Purport, the word Vishvatma refers to one who is situated in everyone's heart. Ishvara sarva bhutanam chishtati. Another meaning of Vishvatma is the only lovable object for everyone. Because of forgetfulness of this object, people are suffering in this material world. But if one fortunately revives his old consciousness of loving Krishna and connects with Vishvatma, one becomes perfect. The Lord is described in the third canto, 3 to 15, as follows. Paravareshu mahad anksha yukto hyato pichato bhagavan. Although unborn, the Lord, the master of everything, appears like a born child by entering the mind of a devotee. The Lord is already there within the mind, and consequently it is not astonishing for him to appear as if born from a devotee's body. The word avivesha signifies that the Lord appeared within the mind of Vasudev. There was no need for a discharge of semen. That is the opinion of Sripad Sridhar Swami and Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. In the Vaishnav Toshini, Srila Sanatana Goswami says that consciousness was awakened within the mind of Vasudev. Srila Viraragha Acharya also says that Vasudev was one of the demigods and that within his mind the Supreme Personality of God had appeared as an awakening of consciousness. So Krishna appears in relationship to his devotees and because of his devotees. And in the Gita, he says, Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskritam dharma samstapanartaya sambhavami yuge yuge. He gives the reason why he appears in the world. And that's to uplift 
the sadhus, the devotees, especially those who are feeling separation from the Lord and living in the material world with the mood of te anukampam susumikshamano. They're always hoping for the mercy of the Lord and they tolerate any of the ups and downs in the material world uh, knowing that these are simply reactions uh, created by their involvement with the material world. And Krishna makes arrangements specifically to come and rescue those devotees as he says in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that he very quickly comes to rescue the devotee from the ocean of birth and death. And the other reason that Krishna comes is to push down the demoniac elements of society. Vinashaya chaduskritam. Those who are duskriti, their um, intentions and activities are bad. Bad because uh, with whatever facilities they get, they use to go against the Supreme Personality of God, either by creating governments that prevent people from worshiping God, for instance, in some Asian countries, which will go unnamed at this time. Uh, there, there's, uh, for instance, a president who just got elected for life, if you can imagine such a thing. And, I mean, we can, because in, in the good sense, a monarch is, is a, um, inherits the throne for life, but such a person is supposed to be a Rajarishi or a, a, a devotee. And uh, we'd be happy <laughs> if that happened and, and there was no election. But in, in today's world where such demoniac persons who hate God and want to impose themselves upon all the others take charge and then they suppress uh, any worship of God within their uh, realm and they try to push it away. These are demoniac persons. Uh, so uh, these kinds of people Krishna describes in the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita where he tells how there are living entities that have divine natures and those that have demoniac natures. Those that are uh, demoniac, he says, avajananti ma muda manushim tanamashritam param bhavam ajananto mamaviyam anutamam mama bhuta maheshwaram. So he says that uh, demoniac people deride the personality of God, the very conception that there is a God at all through scientific presentations or just in the way that they um, declare God is uh, dead or th they deny the existence of God in many different ways. There are many philosophies. Ironically, it's Krishna who's giving intelligence to such people to come up with the ways and means to ignore God and to s spread atheistic ideas all over the world. But these are the kinds of people uh, who are who Krishna says are demoniac. He also describes in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, there are uh, several kinds of people who are specifically considered to be against God. And so Krishna comes to uh, clear the way of take these kinds of people away from the world so that the Dharma can flourish. Because the whole project for the material world is give living entities a chance to go back home, back to Godhead. So when Krishna comes, he kills many demons, and he also has uh, revives his relationships with his uh, pure devotees by speaking Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and all these instructions are uh, memorialized in this in the Shastra, and he also arranges for wars like the Battle of Kukshetra and uh, so that uh, demoniac people can come together all in one place and be annihilated. We know at the very beginning of the 10th Canto of Srimad Bhagavatam that there was an un unnecessary burden on the earth because of the development of these huge armies of demoniac people. So Krishna arranged for them all to come together and he also individually arranged to kill various demons who appeared in Vrindavan and elsewhere and who were a bad influence on the world. So this is, this is Krishna's prerogative when he comes to the world. But most of all, Krishna is interested in 
his devotees, in loving exchanges with his devotees. And he mentions this in the Srimad Bhagavatam when um, Durvasa Muni insults and actually tries to kill Ambarish Maharaj. And then the Sudarshan Chakra begins to chase Durvasa Muni. Durvasa Muni goes to all of the various rulers of the universe and they all say, don't come in here. And finally, he ends up going to Vaikuntha and uh, meeting with the Lord. And the Lord says that my heart is with the devotees. And uh, they're always in my heart. I'm always in their hearts. And that is my preoccupation is my devotees. So I said, he said, I can't help you. You have to go back to Ambarish Maharaj, which he did. And Ambarish Maharaj, of course, forgave him. And the Sudasan Chakra then uh, spared Durvasa Bhuni's life. But in that section of the Bhagavatam, as well as in other sections, but particularly there it's expressed how dear the devotees are to Krishna. So when Krishna comes to the world, he's specifically interested in developing loving relationships with his devotees, and uh, he also brings with him devotees from the spiritual world to enact his pastimes so that others can be attracted and see the different kinds of relationships that he has with them. So uh, Krishna, or Bhagavan, is known as Vishvatma, which means that he's already there within the heart of the devotee. Which is interesting because who knows that he's there? Who actually sees that he's uh, within the heart? Anijadikam manasojavyo. Uh, Krishna is described in the Upanishads as a person who is uh, greater than everyone. He's uh, the demigods, powerful demigods can't approach him, although in one place he surpasses all those who, who, those who supply the air and rain. He surpasses all in excellence. And tadejiti tanajiti tadure tadvantike. He's very far away, but he's very near as well. Means he's there within our hearts all the time, but I can't see him unless I take to the process of a devotional service. And we see here how uh, the Lord appears within the devotee's mind and heart, and then externally manifests himself uh, before the vision of his devotees when, uh, when he desires to do so. So this is something that Krishna asks us to consider all throughout the Bhagavad Gita, and that is that He's already there within the heart. He says it in many, many different places. So one of the places that is very famous, Prabhupada quotes again and again from the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya chaham rajisandi vishto matak smitir jnana mapohanam cha. And that is that Krishna says, I'm within every living entity's heart, and for me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. So Krishna is supplying our intelligence to remember him if we desire to do so. And he also gives us the wherewithal to forget him if we want to do that also. And for the devotees who are worshiping Krishna and remembering him constantly and performing the practice of bhakti yoga, uh, Krishna reveals himself within the heart. Where does he say that in the Bhagavad Gita? Like Tesham Satata Yuktanam, Bajatam Priti Purvakam, Tanami Puri Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayantite. That for someone who is sincerely trying to reach me, I reciprocate from within his heart and I give him knowledge by which he can come to me. And the devotees have that relationship. But here we see also that Krishna takes birth from the mind and heart of the devotees. It's not like the birth of the material world, which is a biological process that takes place between a man and a woman. But actually, uh, Krishna appears within the, the pure mind of his devotees. And as we see the appearance of Krishna in the world, he, he first appeared in the mind of Vasudev, and then Devaki, and then he transferred himself to the womb of Devaki, and then he apparently appeared from the womb of Devaki, although it's a transcendental birth. As Krishna says, Janma Karma Chame Divyam. It's, it's transcendental. One has to understand how this takes place, Krishna says, because 
By knowing that, then one doesn't take birth again here in the material world. If one understands that uh, Krishna is not part of this material world and becomes uh, knowledgeable about how he appears in the world and how his appearance is, is divine. So from Vishvatma, we remember that Krishna is there within our heart fulfilling all desires, as we heard the verse, Sapari He's the primeval philosopher who's, who's there fulfilling the desires of every living entity since a time immemorial. So, in the pastimes of, of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which we're particularly interested in because uh, the devotees uh, who follow Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are, are devotees of, of uh, Lord Krishna, and uh, they want to hear exactly how he appears in this world. And so he has his uh, protocol. We know that at the time when there was a huge burden on the earth due to unnecessary, unnecessary defense forces. Uh, Lord Brahma was approached by the various demigods. And then he went with them to the shore of the ocean of milk in this world, in this universe. And uh, he made a prayer. Very specifically, it's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam that he prayed through the Purusha Sukta. And uh, by reciting the Purushukta and making this prayer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then Krishna reciprocated from within the heart of Brahma. He spoke to him, which is parallel with what it says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Teni Brahma Hridaya Adikavaye Muhyanti Yatsureya. So the, the Lord um, communicates with Brahma, and Brahma then communicates to the demigods of what's happening. And Krishna says that I'm going to appear here with all of my associates. So the demigods should also take birth in various places to get ready. This is called tat priyartam. It means that the Lord prepares the stage. In fact, Kunti later on, we find when she's offering prayers, she says, Maya javani kachanam ajnad hoksa jamavyam nalakshase mudadrisha nata natyo darodyata. She says, Krishna, you're just like a, an actor, and uh, you set the stage, and then the screen, uh, the, the curtains open, and you perform your your pastimes in this world. So, Vishvatma, he's there within the heart, and for those who uh, practice bhakti. Uh, Krishna appears within their heart. The pastimes actually appear there. Like coming to a theater near you. There's all these, uh, when a big movie comes out, you see it everywhere now. Uh, they, they know how to advertise and make sure you know it's coming on a certain date. So when uh, Krishna appears too, he gives this information to Brahma and then the advertising crew goes out and says, you know, these various actors will appear, Krishna will make his appearance in a special theater. These theaters he appears in are called Dhamma. These uh, places uh, that are uh, specifically designated as the embassies here in the material world. They're non-different from the spiritual world, like the Vrajadham. Vrajadham is uh, part of the spiritual world. And even after the annihilation of this world, that Vraja, original Vrajadam, it, uh, it, it never disappears. It only temporarily merges into the uh, spiritual Vrajadam. And when the material world is recreated, it again appears in the material world. So it's never annihilated. It's not like an ordinary uh, dirt and water and everything like that. It's transcendental. So Krishna makes his arrangements to uh, let everybody know he'll be appearing in a certain place. But for the devotees who are practicing bhakti anywhere, at any time, the Lord appears in their hearts and shows his pastimes to the devotees. Within their minds and hearts, he's fully available. And they see his pastimes and they are feeling his, uh, they're, they're receiving his instructions directly. 
For those who are practicing bhakti in the very beginning, we receive the same kind of impetus by hearing about Krishna. We uh, hear Bhagavad Gita, which is the same as hearing directly from Krishna. This is the magic of having uh, the revealed scriptures. When we hear Bhagavad Gita, it's the direct words of Krishna speaking to us. And when we hear Srimad Bhagavatam, it's non different from uh, witnessing the pastimes of, of Krishna within our hearts for those who are ardent hearers. So we know that before uh, Krishna appears, this drama unfolds, and the, the uh, sons of Devaki are killed by Kamsa one after another. These, these sons are not ordinary because they actually were cursed to take a birth and be killed by Kamsa. Uh, they're his sons previously, but uh, because of a curse, they, they then took birth in the womb of Devaki and he killed them one after another. So, Shadagarbha Sura. These uh, uh, special living entities took birth there and then were killed by Kamsa one after another. And then the Acharyas uh, bring up the question, how is it then that uh, Krishna could appear in such a place, in the womb of Devaki, that is, that was already inhabited by these uh, other living entities? And so the answer comes as we enter into the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam that uh, Lord Balaram then appears within that womb. And so Balaram is uh, Krishna's first expansion. And he, as his first expansion, he's the best servitor of Krishna. So he, he acts as the, uh, Krishna's dham. From Balaram, the entire uh, substance, so to speak, of the spiritual world is manifested. For instance, on the Sringhasana, where we worship the Lord, uh, we see there's some form and shape. This is all Balaram. And when Krishna is sporting various paraphernalia, like he has shoes, any of you have deities? Do they have shoes? Those are Balaram. And if the deity is wearing, uh, if Krishna is wearing a Brahmin's thread, that Brahmin's thread is also Balaram. He manifests in that way. Everything in the spiritual world that gives facility, facility means to make something easier for someone, the bed, the shoes, the very ground that the, the devotees uh, walk on or dance on in uh, Goloka is manifested by Balaram. And Balaram also is the spiritual master. So he does, this is a service that he does as the, the guru to uh, cultivate the ground and make everything ready for spiritual life. Just like in a garden, you have to cultivate the ground to make it ready for the garden. So similarly, the guru is one who cultivates the ground, opens up our life so that we're ready to worship Krishna, helps us to remove the obstacles. So Balaram also appears in Krishna's pastimes and he removes the obstacles. So he comes into the womb of Devaki and then is transferred to the womb of Rohini. That's why he's called Sankarsana. And after he appears uh, within the womb, then it becomes a sanctified uh, dham, a place where, where Krishna uh, is ready to appear in this world. So, in the atmosphere of Vrindavan, when uh, Krishna and Balaram appear, there's a lot of tension. Where's that tension coming from? Kamsa is uh, a cruel uh, leader. And he, he's also feared by even the greatest and most powerful demons. And there he's uh, trying to usurp Krishna's power. And he also has a great fear himself of Krishna appearing, and his main intention is to kill Krishna if he appears. So you can imagine uh, from just hearing about ways in which various devotees around the world have gone on to spread the Krishna consciousness movement in various atmospheres, 
uh, how fearful it can be even to, to mention Krishna in a certain place. We'll ask Naveen and Nera to, just to tell us in a, a few uh, words about what it might have been like in um, the former Soviet Union for the devotees to first get started there. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Well, for the... F that uncertainty on how a person will respond is prevalent everywhere in the material world. Even when you go up to somebody here and you tell them, Hare Krishna, you don't know what's their response. <clears throat> so, but the repercussions are different in different places. So in the Soviet Union, people were being persecuted and the government is so um, demoniac that they had spies everywhere. In fact, even now in China, when I was there, every building that you enter, on the entrance, there is the pictures of the two secret servant or military or police agents who are taking care of this building with their names and their phone numbers. So any suspicious activity has to be reported to them. And people are so much in fear that even neighbors or family members or friends will, will rat them out. They will give them over to the authorities. So... Do you know rat them out, what that means? Being a rat. Yeah, if you, if you turn somebody in, you're called a rat. So they call them, if you give somebody over to the authorities, they call you, you ratted them out because you're a big rat. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So even the devotees who were practicing in the confines of their own homes, they were never sure when, who would be knocking on the door or, or who would be calling or who would be watching them. And they knew that the government was onto them because they're very all pervasive, so to speak. Just like in China, on every light pole, like you have these light poles on the street which illuminate the street, there's a CCTV on every light pole in the country. There's a CCTV, so you don't know who is watching you while you're moving, while you're talking, what you're saying. And so <clears throat> they were always in fear, and that fear, in a sense, was <coughs> making things very difficult. <coughs> but in another sense also it was really purifying them and making them intensely take shelter of Krishna and, and all these early devotees were very, very deep in their faith and in their dedication because there was no such thing as a, as a fair weather devotee. There was no such thing as a person who just turns up once in a week or once in a year for a festival. Either you're doing this wholeheartedly or you just drop it. So, You know, when devotees would find people who were interested, they had to very carefully bring them into the group because they didn't know whether they were government agents or not. And many of them were government agents. And some became devotees. <laughs> <coughs> In fact, the, the chief state persecutor who, who made huge case against devotees and put many devotees in jail, his son became a devotee. And that broke his heart. That completely finished him off. Good. <laughs> Jai. <laughs> In the in the mood, thank you so much, Navina Prabhu. In, so you can imagine in Vrindavan how this mood prevailed. Even when Krishna was born, he had to have his name giving ceremony in a cow shed, because uh, at that time all children were at risk. But very specifically, Kamsa was looking for Krishna, so they couldn't have a big ceremony, so they had to hide it and they wanted to keep everything quiet. And there were these agents uh, uh, infiltrating, circling everywhere. And of course, these de demons could disguise themselves. For instance, even when Krishna was a baby, somehow or other Putana infiltrated and found out where Krishna was as a little baby and 
She was a demoness who disguised herself as a beautiful nursemaid. And she came into the house of Ananda and Yashoda after Krishna had been moved to, to the Raj uh, to hide him. And uh, she had smeared deadly poison on her breasts in order to kill Krishna. But of course, Krishna killed her and the, he, she assumed her huge body again, eight miles long. She crashed to the ground after Krishna uh, killed her. Incidentally, she smashed only the orchards that were especially um, taken care of for Kamsa. She didn't touch anything else. When Krishna makes arrangements, they're very tidy. We can remember this in our lives also. We may think that there are a lot of uh, loose ends, but for devotees, uh, there are no loose ends. Krishna knows how to make everything work perfectly. If he can uh, make this eight mile long demoness crash to the ground and not touch any of the uh, dear residents of Raj, but only smash the beloved orchards of Kamsa to the ground. Then at the same time, when he makes arrangements for us in our life, uh, we can, although we may think otherwise, we should have faith and understand that when things are uh, happening, maybe even things crashing all around us, we should understand that Krishna knows how to make them crash in the right way uh, to uh, help us. So this was going on at the time when, when Krishna made his appearance in this world. There was great fear and tension everywhere in Vrindavan. Now, the, the Acharyas mentioned that this fear, especially Devaki and Vasudev, because uh, apparently it's their child. Of course, Krishna is nobody's child. He uh, is mentioned uh, as Devaki Janmavadu. Uh, uh, he walks amongst the people. Jananivasa. It means the, the one who's uh, not related to anyone because he's the source of everyone, but still he walks amongst the people. And he relates to others as uh, relatives, friends, lovers, and so forth. But he's the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so uh, Krishna's um, moving about the, the people, here, there, and everywhere. And in this mood of uh, fear, there's that Devaki and Vasudev have, and all the residents of, uh, who, are, who love Krishna, and they want to hide him as, uh, from the treacherous Kamsa, the acharyas like like Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur mentioned that this fear burns off their uh, any last vestiges of attachment to the material world, and then they go on to say that the the practitioners of bhakti they also are fearful of living in a material body because we have senses that Krishna say says in the Bhagavad Gita at any time can betray us. We're living. Uh, with these uh, kind of foreign agents, in a sense. The mind can be the best friend or the worst enemy. And our own senses, even as we, we have the intention to practice Krishna consciousness, can suggest some completely contrary idea at any time. Possible? Yes. It's like, so who said that? And then the sense is, yeah, that's us. We'll, we'd like to have one of these. And it's like, well, that's not allowed, you know. So we want it anyway. So the devotee says should always have a sense of this fear when living uh, in the sadaka's body. Because until one's senses and mind are completely purified, we're living with an enemy. In various poetry, there's a description of the senses to be like highwaymen. In Vrindavan, it used to be more common, I think. I haven't read actual statistics. But I can remember times that, for instance, uh, maybe 25 years ago when I was in Vrindavan and it was the appearance of Radhakund. Everyone stays up past midnight. And then devotees were driving home on the, on the back road. Not a good idea. Late at night, but there was a log across the road and then some guys jumped out with guns. They robbed them. Somebody got shot. Uh, these are highwaymen. Just when you're least ex expecting it, you're driving down the road, they have some trap for you and they'll jump out 
And they might even throw you down a, a blind well and just leave you there. So the senses are like that, say our acharyas, that they're like highwaymen. They can jump out and rob us at any time of our greatest gift, which is our Krishna consciousness. So the devotees also should have this sense of, of wariness about the senses and about the material world in general, and not interact uh, freely with them, and also not trust the senses. In the fifth canto also, it's mentioned that the senses are like wild animals. Sometimes somebody catches a wild animal and brings it home, says, look, see, he's tame, he likes us. And after a few weeks feeding him, they think he's just like one of the family. And then they just become lax, and they leave the cage open, and the next day they come up, the kids are all gone, they've been eaten, uh, houses torn up, windows broken, animals gone. So same thing, the senses are like that too. We should not trust them and think that, uh, oh look, they're fine. We have to have a sense of, of fear. And this metaphor is going on during the appearance of uh, Balaram and Krishna, that uh, uh, Krishna is appearing in our lives as well. He manifests as Vishvatma. He's there within the heart, but he manifests in our life as we transform our environment, uh, including our mind and senses, by engaging it strictly in the process of bhakti. And when we do, then Krishna uh, manifests himself more and more in our lives. Krishna says something so wonderful that I reciprocate with every living entity. I'm not aware of it when my attention is turned elsewhere. I'm only aware of Krishna's external energy. But for the sadhakas who turn their attention towards Krishna, they begin to perceive how Krishna is reciprocating with them in their lives. And we know the more that we surrender, the more Krishna, there's a fruit that Krishna offers us. And, and therefore the devotees become more and more encouraged to dedicate themselves. I'm turning mine off. <laughs> That's from China. <laughs> Did you buy that from China? <laughs> so we should be aware of Vishvatma, that Krishna is there within our heart, and that his main purpose is to manifest in our life more and more. And we should have a, a healthy fear of maya and of the senses. And we should also remember Krishna's words that as they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. And give ourselves to the process of bhakti so that more and more uh, Krishna feels free to manifest himself in, in our lives. This is the uh, true happiness of life. And we should also know that Krishna is completely capable of taking away any of the obstacles that are in our life. So in the pastimes of Krishna and Balaram, the uh, Lord, the two lords, kill many demons. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, each one of these demons uh, represents one of the anartas that we have to overcome in our lives. And for instance, um, uh, Krishna kills Putana. Uh, Putana is obviously related to, f to uh, falsehoods, like uh, falsely presenting oneself as a teacher when one has ulterior motives. And then there's also uh, Shakatasura, the cart demon, which was the second demon Krishna killed, or perhaps the third. Maybe the third was uh, Vyomasura. But uh, the Shakatasura demon has to do with the, the various kinds of extra things that we carry around in our lives that we don't need, that weigh us down. And he goes through each one of the demons and he explains how by hearing about Krishna, by chanting Krishna's names, by remembering him, and by keeping this uh, mood of being afraid of the senses, not just interacting with them freely. We should understand that these are uh, can be our allies, but in, in the conditional life and in the conditional atmosphere that we're in, that they can turn on, on us at any minute, so we should be very, very careful. That uh, Krishna will come and help us annihilate these demons. 
And Bhaktivinoda Thakur also says, uh, Balaram killed various demons. For instance, Pralambasura. Pralambasura is one of the demons that uh, Balaram personally killed with his own fist. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that for, for, to annihilate the, the anartas represented by the demons that Balaram killed, we also have to put in our own work. We have to work for those things. And means that we have to be vigilant in our own practice. Help us help him to annihilate uh, these various demons. And now we'll take a few reflections before we move on to the next section. Navina Prabhu and then Mukaravinda. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. What is the relation between healthy fear and unhealthy fear? Sometimes there is this criticism that, oh, you are mindlessly following, or people are saying, it took me many months to get free from this mind control. And then we hear that there is a healthy fear that you were elaborating upon, but there is also unhealthy fear that we can fall prey to or fall into the trap of. So how do they relate in this context? Well, we do have to control our minds. That's something that Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita. Because the mind can become the best friend or the worst enemy. And we have to be aware of the fact that unless we regulate the senses in the mind, then the, they can take advantage of us. And we've seen, we see in the Shastra, there are very advanced yogis, Vishwamrita, after thousands of years, he was victimized by Menaka because he, he held something still within his heart. So he just heard her footbills jingle. He didn't even see her yet. And then, you know, he was attracted. There was an idea there within his heart. And then there's uh, Sobari Muni, who had also something in his heart when he saw fish in the water who were copulating. Then he, he became attracted to Grahasta life. Later on, he rebuked himself for falling into that. Bharat Maharaj is another example of a very advanced personality, a devotee, who then uh, fell from his position. So the Shastras give us these examples so that we don't become uh, overly confident. In fact, it's mentioned that uh, we shouldn't consider ourselves liberated. Prabhupada mentions this. He said, first of all, it's a regulative principle not to fall down. This is a regulative principle, don't fall down. There are various levels at which one can fall down. And so one should be vigilant not to fall victim to uh, distraction to start with. Because there's no end to it. Once one becomes distracted by small things, then more and more one's life can become distracted. And people say, oh, don't worry about such and such, it's just normal activity. And it's like, oh, what happened to such and such? So uh, if one considers I'm not liberated, then this is a, a healthy idea. You can see that if somebody interacts with the world cautiously, but not neurotically, that is having uh, normal relationships uh, with um, devotees, as the Shastra says, in respectful ways, being careful not to uh, criticize devotees unnecessarily, uh, to uh, be in a service mood. This is also being careful. There's etiquette when we deal with different devotees. We shouldn't dispense with it at any time because of some discord that we're having. We should be careful about that. At the same time, the Shastra says it's healthy to keep oneself separate from those who are against God. This is in the, in the verse which says, Ishvare tadadineshu bali sheshu tu satsucha prema maitri kripopeksha yakroti samadhyamaha. The madhyama devotee, middle devotee, is careful to cultivate appropriate friendships with devotees and to avoid those who are against God. And the Acharyas go on to say that if there are devotees also that are of loose character or don't know how to avoid criticizing devotees and so forth, then one should also 
uh, keep a, a, a healthy distance from them also. And so uh, the Shastric in, injunctions are there, and one, sh one has to be artful in doing that. This is uh, an art that has to be learned, how to move in the world without uh, offending others. At the same time, you have to protect yourself from outside influences. And you can see that uh, when devotees are expert at that, you'll notice that they know how to interact properly with all different kinds of people without uh, offending them, but at the same time, they act appropriately. So when the, the action is appropriate, appropriate and according to Shastra, then it's healthy. And if it becomes inordinate or... Um, overly restrictive so that one can't do one's service, then it could be un unhealthy. Yeah, uh, Mukharvin and then Prabhu in the back. And then Shraddha. And then two more over here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, thank go ahead. Sir. Thank um, thank you so much for bringing such a, first of all, the song that you sang in the first of Narutam Das Thakur, how you mentioned Goloke, uh, the song mentions that Goloke Rapi Medhana Harinam Sankirtan. So I, I was just thinking how uh, we are so blessed that we have opportunity in our life and also to give the same, same the best, uh, the wealth to others by engaging in Sankirtan, specifically book distribution, Harinam or Prashadam distribution. And we can make other people, and first of all our life and other people's life the same than that is from the Golok comes. So that song reminded me of that aspect. And second thing, um, thank you so much, so nicely you put about why Krishna appears in this world. And, um, and you very clearly mentioned it's for devotee and for them only. And I, in, in your talk, I think you one verse, um, you quoted and you wanted to quote that uh, from the Durvasa Muni's past time uh, in which he says that sadho hridayam mahiyam sadhu naam hridayam tuham mad anyat te na janati naham te bhyo managapi Translation The pure devotee is always within the core of my heart and I am always in the heart of pure devotee. My devotee do not know anything else but me and I do not know anyone else but them. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? No, thank you. Very important points to remember where Krishna's heart is. It's within the heart of the devotees. And out of all the different processes of devotional service, if one is, if one, even in one's very busy life, in, at very, in a particular stage, is careful to associate with advanced devotees as much as possible, and also to attend uh, to chanting as much as possible, whether in kirtan or japa. These two things, uh, despite whatever else is going on in one's life, will, will help us to advance in devotional service. And then it goes back to, who was it? Oh, Prabhu, yes. Yeah, my question was, uh, how does one distinguish between a devotee whose intentions are sincere and a devote or somebody who's demonic actually and who's masquerading as a devotee, you know, just superficially show, uh, showing they're a devotee. Well, um, it's, it's a, an intention is not something that one can see necessarily. It's not uh, like a car or something like that. But we do feel intentions we do have a sense that uh, people have intentions and we feel them. They come out in their speech, especially. So the Shastra says, be aware of how somebody speaks and uh, what kind of effect they're having as well. Because sometimes people will uh, say the right things, but they say them in the wrong way. And eventually our intentions come out in the, in the way we associate and the way we work. So we have to be observant. And sometimes people's intentions change because living entities are changeable. Because we're so tiny, we can become effective, uh, affected. Uh, living entities, uh, they flip all the time. They think this way, and then all of a sudden they f think another way. So it's an active uh, process. And mostly we have to become aware of it by purifying our own intention. Because we become more and more aware of what's pure and what's not pure when 
we take time to purify ourselves. Uh, fire uh, likes to associate with fire because it's the same element. And in order to approach Krishna, uh, we, who's like fire, we have to become fire-like. And as an example, if we're experiencing uh, refinement in our own consciousness, we'll be much more aware of other people's intentions. As an example, those who distribute books and become masterful at it, they can meet somebody and within a couple of seconds, they can s feel, it's not like, uh, it's like a mystic um, endowment. They'll notice like where somebody's uh, coming from. It's like if somebody eats garlic and walks into a room of people who uh, eschew garlic, eschew means to, to reject, uh, to shun, so not to chew it, but to es eschew. <laughs> Uh, so somebody who chews garlic comes into a room of people who eschew garlic. Uh, you know, we can be sitting in a room and everyone will turn and look like, hey, you've been eating garlic. It's like, I can't see it, but I know it's there. I know you ate it because it's coming out of every pore of your body. So intention is, uh, becomes, uh, aware, we become aware of people's intentions when, when we ourselves uh, purify our intentions. We'll notice it more in other people. So this is uh, coming from Krishna. He gives us the intelligence. This is one of the meanings of Tesham Satati Yuktanam Bhajatam Priti Purvakam. Dadami Bhuti Yogam Tam. He gives Bhuti uh, how to come to him. Part of that is who to go to. After all, how does one find a guru in the first place? It's by Krishna's mercy. He, Krishna, understands the intention in the heart of the living entity who says, I need help and I'm willing to surrender to get it. <laughs> and then Krishna says, okay, here's a representative, somebody who uh, represents me because uh, they've gone through the same process, they're following the Shastra or they've been sent from the spiritual world, either one. And uh, then Krishna gives the intelligence. It's an internal process. So this is one of the ways in which Vishvatma, who's being spoken about here, empowers us to understand what are the intentions of others. And I've seen it. I've seen, I have a god brother who's a, a very perceptive, uh, and I spent some time with him, and we'd meet somebody, and we'd walk away, and he'd know exactly, <laughs> he'd know exactly, he'd be able to, um, understand, you know, where the person, what was uh, their intention, basically. I would have to say that 99% of the time he was correct. Uh, so uh, we can become perceptive like that. So start with your own intentions, purify them, be aware of what your intentions are, and when they become purified, you'll become very much more aware of what other people's intentions are. Even when they speak, um, uh, we'll, we'll understand also, listening very carefully to speech. Yes. Oh, and you had internet. Okay, go ahead, internet. Oh, you have, okay. You're next. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, I was really uh, thinking about the analogy that you gave about even the senses, when, even when they seem harmless, uh, you're comparing that to an a wild animal that's tamed, that seemed like tamed. Uh, and you let it in, and after some time you open the cage and it destroys and runs away. So similarly senses, I, I like that analogy. And the extending that analogy, I was thinking when the, ta when the wild animal comes back and you put that in cage, and after some time it, it behaves as if it's tamed, and then somehow uh, stupidly we open the cage again and it, it ruins our lives again. So we keep seeing that the senses, when um, not in control, uh, they keep they keep troubling us, and we we uh, we have that feeling of remorse again and again and again. And I really liked how uh, submitting ourselves to Krishna will actually help. Yeah, so remember we're in a dangerous atmosphere, and anything can happen. Shastra gives warnings: Matra swasva tu hitrava na bavet balavan indriyagramo vidvamsam apikarshiti. Apikarshiti. So it says, uh, one should not sit on the same seat with one's uh, mother, sister, daughter. 
And then someone says, that's crazy, because, uh, because it says uh, the senses can become attracted. That is for a man to sit on the same seat. So it, it gives this a, a, a very uh, strict idea about mixing between men and women, because then uh, someone might say then that, uh, well, that's for a very low-class person. But then the Bhagavatam says, uh, no, vidvam sum, a uh, vidvam, uh, somebody who's very uh, refined, high class, apikarshati, even that person can become attracted. B why? Balavan indriya gramo, the senses are so strong that they can grab us and pull us away at any minute. Krishna says a similar thing in uh, a Bhagavad Gita, that even a person of discrimination uh, can be grabbed at any time by the senses and pulled in a different direction. So what the acharyas are saying in the mood, in the in the atmosphere of Vrindavan, that kind of fear that, that, that's there, and when Krishna is appearing, they're re relating that to the sadakas, and they're saying that you should also have some modicum of of fear, not debilitating fear, not where you become neurotic, but where you're mindful that at any moment, the if you leave the door open, and Prabhupada you know, had a little kitchen up in his room in Los Angeles. It's in a closet, and a very simple thing. So Shruti Kirti Prabhu was explaining why Prabhupada had a kitchen in his closet. And because he had so many servants, and then they'd go in the kitchen, and the men and women are working together in the kitchen, and then his uh, servant that he just spent a lot of time training up would come back a month or two later and say, Prabhupada, I gotta go. And it's like, where are you going? It's like, I'm getting married. Bye, you know. And I was like, what happened? They mixed in the kitchen. So I was like, a couple. <laughs> like, Me? Yeah, you. I was like, oh my God, I gotta go. You know. So th these things are uh, not to be um, underestimated. Says the shastra. You have to be careful, not that you become antisocial, not that, that you become, um, you know, the enemy of the opposite sex or, uh, you know, of every karmi in the world, but, but you have to internally have a, a sense of, of awareness which resembles fear, that if I leave the cage open, I'm not qualified. One should feel like that. I'm not... I'm not liberated, therefore I have to be careful how I mix with the material world. Otherwise, as the Shastra says, the spiritual life is like the blade of a razor, the sharpened uh, blade of a razor. And uh, if you're inattentive, not careful, then at any minute there can be bloodshed. So this is being taught to us by the scripture and especially in a culture where anything goes. Uh, one has to be uh, aware of this and careful. Thank you. Uh, Shraddha. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. Actually, uh, when you picked up the words on today, I was just wondering, like, you know, why did you pick that particular <laughs> verse? Because it appeared very simple on the face of it. And then, you know, you dug deep into the ocean of Srimad Bhagavatam and brought out so many gems. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. Well, I've been thinking about the appearance of Balaram, because uh, Balaram comes and then Krishna comes, and Balaram's coming pretty soon too. And so I was, I just, and also simultaneously, I just finished the ninth canto, and I just, you know, started getting into the tenth canto, and so um, I just happened to be in that section. Okay. That's why. Thank, thank you for that. So two things, um, uh, Maharaj, uh, that stuck my mind. One was that you were saying that when things are crashing around you, uh, just keep in mind that Krishna is doing it and he knows how to make things crash. And um, you told the story about how Putna fell and only crashed the orchards. And so my sister-in-law has some orchards, you know, down south. And she was saying, like, when the tornadoes come, it, it happens sometimes that, you know, your patch will be saved, but the one on the left and one on the right are completely gone. So you can see Krishna's, you know, hand working there. Um, and the second thing was about the senses, of course. Um, so I was, I was watching, I was listening to one of the classes that um, Karvinda Prabhu gave. And so he... Um, once when coming out of the Caltrain, he saw there was some commotion 
on the station, something had happened, so suddenly two ambulances pulled up and the police came and there were sirens and things like that. And what he got from there was he said that, you know, when you, when you have material desires and your senses are carrying you away, this is how you should act on them, you know, with, with full force, with, um, you know, all the ammunitions and there's, there's garbage over there. And then, so uh, that yeah. you saw ambulances? The fire brigade. What happened? The, yeah. Fire brigade and so F fire brigade, ambulance, police. So he Putting saw. Out a fire. He, 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 um, no, the, the, uh, you know how something has somebody calls nine one one and all of them arrive there. So right. something like that had happened. So he was just witnessing that and he was saying, you know, when your material desires come up, this is how you should attack them. You know, from all all possible angles. You know, fire brigade comes and call the police. Comes, call the police. <laughs> 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 call nine one one. What do you need? Well. Here's what it is. <laughs> Do you have a Bhagavad Gita handy? <laughs> yeah, we need a, a 911 line, especially, it's mentioned, Kuya Makati Prichati. We should have a, a, a special line where we can call out to devotees. We should have that kind of open thing. Um, it's a very brilliant observation Chaitanya Charan made about how, how it is an advanced devotee could fall victim. To the senses. And so he says, the devotee becomes advanced, definitely advanced. And then people start appreciating, seeing, advanced, and reinforce that by appreciating. And then the person has um, this uh, desire to uh, protect that image, uh, not necessarily out of false ego even, but even out of a sense that he doesn't want to disappoint anyone. So let's say that there is some fire that comes up. An arta can come up at any time uh, from anywhere. The, the Bhagavatam says, Supada mulam bhajata priyasya taktanya bhavasya hari priyashaha. is mentioning how from here, there, or anywhere it can just come up because of our involvement in the material world. So then, if that person doesn't have a peer uh, or a, an outlet, a person to talk to, Guhyamakyati Prichati, where he can say, okay, here I'm having this problem. Then he has to process it uh, without any help. And that's dangerous. So one should have a 911 line, someone to call where they feel uh, they can be vulnerable and say, and still uh, maintain their um, sense of, of a self. Uh, not be demoralized or exposed or something like that, so they can deal with it. So this is, this is a very important uh, point that uh, Rupa Goswami makes about association with devotees, that you have to have that in order to process all these kinds of things. Yes, there was one more, or two. Who's got the mic? <laughs> okay, you got it. One, two, three. Go ahead. Ty goes to the runner. <laughs> I really love the point of, uh, you know, we being in this, uh, you know, gross body and a subtle body. We have to be so careful. The choices that we make, I was just remembering when I first, I don't know too much computers, but when I first learned uh, computers, um, you know, they used to draw, make us draw flow charts. So I was just thinking in the flow chart diagram, uh, every choice you make is the choice that takes you up or down. So if, I, if my mind says, oh, you know what, it's okay, just go, just do this, which is not even Krishna conscious, then um, I say yes, and then I go down. If I say no, I st start going up. But <laughs> my question is, you know, in the process of um, all these years, you know, uh, there are times when I know I'm in association of devotees, just doing very good sadhana and everything, and then all of a sudden, without even noticing or knowing, suddenly you would have done things that are actually not uh, supposed to be done. And then you suddenly wake up after, it, it's literally in the dream state that you would have gone to, and after four days saying, what was I trying to accomplish with this? It could be because of lust, greed, anger, pride, anything. So I was just thinking that um, how do we make sure we always have the arrow going up and uh, try our best never to make these mistakes over and over again. I just remember the analogy of uh, the elephant that has a bath and keeps putting mud on itself. Well, it's not exactly like uh, that for devotees. Um, that particular example of putting mud on one's uh, back, like the elephant does, 
that um, is given there, it's especially meant for uh, karma khandis. They uh, perform uh, sinful activities and then they use prayaschitta to reform themselves, but the desire is still there within the heart. And therefore, uh, they become uh, recontaminated again by a force of their own de desire. Uh, devotees, however, um, are described a little differently. For instance, as we've quoted many times, the, the jata shraddha matkatasu nirvina sarva karmasu veda dukatmakam kamams prityage pyanishvara. Next line. Tatoba jetamam prita shradalur dridanishchaya jushamanams tatankamams dukodarkams tagariyam. This is Krishna himself speaking and saying, a devotee may, uh, in an interim period, uh, be disgusted with the material world, knows that all sense gratification leads to misery, but at the same time doesn't have the power to uh, not engage in it. Paritya Ishvara means supreme control, it also means the power to do something. So Paritya doesn't have the power to give up sense gratification, even though it has full awareness that it's not good. Then, uh, next line. Tato bajeta, he says, she go on worshiping. He says, Tato bajeta mam prita ashradha lur jurdhanishchaya. You should be uh, firm in your determination and faith. Can continue. Jushamanams means continue, go on. Jushamanams to tankamams. Um, Duko darkams to garyan. You should have a little bit of uh, garyan, uh, a little bit of remorse, but don't become uh, overwhelmed by that so that you don't engage in devotional service. So there is an interim period for devotees where they know what to do, they know what's the right thing to do, but they can't do it. Prabhupada also mentions in the light of the Bhagavat that there's a way in which uh, we may make mistakes while we're performing our devotional practice. And he said these may not be detrimental. They may be the pillars to success if one is sincere. For instance, in the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, api chet sudaracharo bhajate mamananya bhak, sadhureva samantavya samyag vyavasito hisa. Krishna says, if somebody is rightly situated, means they have decided they're going to surrender to Krishna, but still they mess up. Sudaracharo. They do something that's worldly minded. He said, still they have to be considered saintly. Why? Shri Pram Bhavati Dharmatma Shashvas Chantim Nagachati Konteya Pratijani Nami Bhakti Pranashiti Because somebody situated with that determination uh, will definitely become successful by Krishna's mercy. In the purport, as you know well, Prabhupada writes that uh, you, you, your heart has to be in the right place. These things happen. Now, uh, Kali Yuga is here. And in his uh, commentary to the very famous uh, verse about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which starts, Dhyayam sada paribhavagnam abhishta doham tirtaspadam shiva vrinchi nutam sharanyam vrityartiham pranatapala pavabdipotam vande mahapurushate charanara vindam. This verse says that Lord Chaitanya, the Mahaprabhu, is fit to be meditated upon. Dhyayam sada, when always. Paribhavagnam uh, abhishta doham. He will free you from all the embarrassments of life. Embarrassment means being dragged down into sense gratification. Even though you're a soul, you're part of the spiritual world. What the heck are you doing here? And he'll fulfill your heart's desire. Abhishta doham. Tir taspadam. He goes on from there to speak. Now in the purport, a very important section you'll find in the uh, middle of this purport. It's mentioned in this verse... Uh, in this regard, Srila Vishnu, well, I'll read the previous, uh, it says, in this verse, the word tirtaspadam means that the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are the shelter of all holy places. As the Krishna consciousness movement spreads all over the world, we often find, especially in poor third world countries, that it is very difficult for people to travel to India to visit the most exalted holy places, such as Vrindavan and Mayapur. Especially in South America, it is very difficult for a large number of devotees to visit such places in India and purify themselves. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so merciful that simply by worshipping him, 
Vaishnavas throughout the world receive the benefit of having visited the Supreme Holy Place, namely the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Thus, there is no loss for the followers of the Krishna consciousness movement despite their external situation. In this regard, Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur has stated, Kalau dravya desha kriyari janitam durvaram upavritriyam api nashankaniyam iti bhavaha. In this age, the world is so polluted by sinful life that it is very difficult to become free from all the symptoms of Kali Yuga. Still, one who is faithfully serving the missionary work of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu need not fear occasional unavoidable symptoms of Kali Yuga. The followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu strictly follow the four regulated principles of no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. They try to always chant Hare Krishna and engage in the service of the Lord. However, it may happen that by accident, an occasional symptom of Kali Yuga, such as envy, anger, lust, greed, etc., may momentarily appear in the life of a devotee. But if such a devotee is actually surrendered to the lotus feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, by his mercy, such an unwanted symptom or anarta will click quickly disappear. Therefore, a sincere follower of the Lord should never be discouraged in the execution of his prescribed duty, but should be confident that he will be protected by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Tirtasparam Shiva Varinchi Nutam Sharanyam Vrityartiham Pranatapala Papapti Potam. So, you know, it's a hard time, a Kali Yuga. This is from uh, 11.533, the famous verse that. Uh, written by Karabhaja and Amuni about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You'll find many such uh, pieces of advice throughout the Shastra, not the least of which is this other verse, which I already quoted. Sopada mulam bhajata priyasya tyaktanya bhavasya hare priyishaha vikarma yach chot patitam. Somehow or other, somebody falls into vikarma, but he's a devotee. Krishna. Uh, knows, because he's there within the heart. He knows the intention of the devotee, and he rectifies the devotee. And so, um, things happen. So, suck it up and keep going. Um, what else? Yes. Okay. Hare Krishna, thank you for a nice class. So, I, I've just changed my question. <laughs> um, there's so many questions, so I'll just pick She took one. your question? <laughs> well, no, it... <laughs> No, oh, not, not, not quite. You, oh. So the idea of the discussion of fear was uh, yes. one of the first questions I had. And uh, I think it, it, it seems like in, in the uh, responses we, we can address fear either through a way of um, avoiding, perhaps not you know, associating with people who do not believe in God and so forth that you mentioned. And the other is to have a lot of discipline and some level of, you know, high level of determination to be on the path. So. Those are, are, are great. And then, and, then, and then you just pointed out that every, sorry, every day there is uh, something we, every moment we can be having to fight that because this is the material world in Maya. So we're, we're in that every moment, you know, in the time space. We're often there, and especially if we work or have to associate with so many people. It's kind of like a full-on battle. <laughs> it's coming at us in, in, a, you know, in a very powerful way, right? So one has to be extremely strong, extremely disciplined, and have very good discernment of when to uh, engage and when not to. So I was thinking that, um, and I think you started to talk about this in the verse, that at some point you have to have a practice which allows you to suddenly disengage from that and take, you know, take the higher road instead of being succumbed by it. Um, and I think this verse that you're talking about is, is being at the feet of Mahaprabhu and having that in the, uh, the Vishata that the, this chapter is about, having the, in that in the heart and allowing that to take over versus the self-control, right? So allowing our own. Um, so is, is, that what you're, is that what you're moving towards? I don't know. Yes. Well, so actually, you know, you mentioned this battle that's going on. Uh, that's true. And it's described as a, as a battle constantly and so forth. But we don't notice it so much, do we? 
because uh, we're already, we fortified ourselves. In, in Govardhan, where we stay every year, there's this, uh, what devotees some kind calls a palace, because it, it was, this king had a, uh, there's a lot of kings in India, so this king had this uh, so-called palace built. It's actually a f fairly simple dwelling, but it has really thick walls. It had, does have turrets where you could, you know, shoot at enemies if you wanted. But there's a bhajan kutir on top also. And there's, there's rooms for the king and queen, separate places, and some of the servants and stuff. The place was in a ruin, and then it was uh, rebuilt by Keshav Bharti Maharaj and a Sikh Krishna who stayed there without electricity at Govardhan for several years to build it back. Now, uh, recently, I started calling it a fortress, because I like that word better. People say, oh, you're going to the palace? And it's like, we're not living in a palace. We sleep on the floor, you know. But, uh, and we, all we do is hear and chant all day and eat kitchri, you know, so it's not a palace. Get over it. Um, what it is, though, is a fortress. Why is it a fortress? Because we lock ourselves in there. That's why we go there. And we hear and chant all day long, from morning till night, till the minute we fall asleep. And that's the fortress. And all of you do that. Everyone, we've been, we have this system in, uh, given to us by Prabhupada, no matter whether you live in Govardhan or you live in uh, Cupertino, <laughs> that you, our lives are fortressed by the uh, process of devotional service we've been taught. We take f the four regular principles, you know, as a normal part of our life. Uh, in fact, I heard Prabhupada recently, somebody was asking about fasting. Prabhupada said, you're already fasting. <laughs> we don't eat anything that people eat. You know, it's like, you know, when you go somewhere, someone says, what do you eat? It's like, you don't eat anything, right? <laughs> For them, you know, we're, our lifestyle is so different. We're in a fortress already. We wake up, we chant our rounds because we couldn't imagine going a day without chanting our rounds. And so we, we already fortify our lives in such a way that, uh, that we feel protected. This is the meaning of ashrama, uh, one of the meanings, that we, we, we fortress ourselves so that we don't get attacked. We do it ahead of time. And we also hear and chant. So when we do go interact with people, which we have to do all the time, like normal human beings, better than normal <laughs> human beings, because people are looking like, how, does this, how do these so-called spiritual people act, you know, they're thinking. And, and when you ha act with refinement and with grace and with aplomb and panage or whatever other word you want to use when you're dealing with other people, then, um, not aplomb, panage, sorry, that there's a way in which, you know, they appreciate. This is people with uh, spiritual values who are practicing. They, ha they have um, dexterity in dealing with other people. And so uh, we, are, we do fortify ourselves. And so it's not that we have to freak out at every minute that uh, somebody's going to come at us, because we actually feel safe. We, see, we feel safe because we trust the process. And if you stick to the process, don't go outside that line, you know, like Lakshman, or was it Ram or Lakshman? Lakshman put the line out there and said, don't go past this, you know. We have that also. And if, if you just don't do anything crazy, and, you know, it's like, well, walk outside the line anyway. That line, you know, we have to have clearly in our heart, you know, what is it? And that is that if I don't chant my rounds, then uh, I'm going to start thinking about... Um, you know, who knows what? Instead of selling Bhagavad Gita, I might think somebody will offer me opportunities. Like, we have soap on a rope. Um, you can sell soap on a rope. And you're like, soap on a rope? Nobody ever thought of that before. Let's get soap on a rope. And uh, you'll start selling that. And, and do, any, do any old thing and eat anything. So I mean, how about eating this? Do you want to eat this? And you're like, yeah, maybe I should. That's what happens to living entities. They get stupid really fast if they don't <laughs> chant Hare Krishna. So you have to, you have to fortify yourself. And, and devotees who live within that circle, they feel safe because they know the process is Krishna and Krishna will protect me. Even if I go outside and I'm dealing with people, I have to do business. And the Bhagavatam says when you, when you interact, you have to. You know, you work, you have to be out there. So how do you interact? People say, this, this, that, that. And you say, yes, sir, very good, sir. 
But in your heart, you're going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. <laughs> and so the, this is how we, we, we go through our life. Not in a crazy way. Uh, you, know, you don't have to close yourself in and, and uh, lock all the doors. We move around, but we're, we're locked up here because our, our heart is dedicated to the process. Yes. One, two. So, so Maharaj, when the mind is giving you trouble and taking you down all the paths, I, I was thinking that I was thinking about the story that you told about one. Uh, I don't know whether he was a god brother, but one devotee who spent his whole time in uh, in Vrindavan, and when the time came for him to leave, he wanted to board the plane and come to USA. Actually, he was in New York, and he had sort of fallen away from the process, and then he he got a terminal illness, and he was in the hospital watching TV. And so one of his uh, god brothers and friends came in there and said, snap out of it. It was one of those Vidura Dhritarashtra minutes. <laughs> and it's like, here's your ticket. Get on the plane. He brought him to Vrindavan. And, and then as the disease got worse, you know, he was in, we didn't have a hospice back then, but he was in some place. And, you know, he was slightly delirious, but, you know, uh, they found him walking down the road, like, where are you going? It's like, I, I got to go back to New York. You know, so... Anyway, just illustrating. And what's your go ahead with your point? My point was that you know when your when your mind is giving you trouble, nothing to beat the association of a devotee. Yes, because he actually st stopped him. That's so, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. T we we take shelter of devotees on all sides. Yeah, yeah. there's a reflection. Even if we forget, yeah. and they'll they'll help us. Yeah, and there's a reflection Please. on the internet. So this is Govind Charan Prabhu. Govind Charan, the heavyweights are signing in now. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I really like the point about living in a state of healthy fear. This fear is not the same fear of being averse from Krishna that's spoken of in the 11th canto, Bhayam Ditya Abhiminit the Syat. Rather, this is the fear of our forgetfulness of the consequences of not taking shelter of Krishna due to distraction. The benefit of such healthy fear is that we come closer to Krishna. Thank you for the nice class. Yeah, nice point. It, it, you know, this theme is, is interesting to talk about and helpful. That, that refinement I'm talking about, you'll notice it in advanced devotees that they know which buttons not to push. Just like if you get on your computer, you have to use a computer nowadays to communicate, but you also have to be aware of the environment there because you could push the wrong button. And, you know, your reputation could be ruined or your mind could be totally distracted. So there's so many things, uh, buttons that you can push. And if you just push one button, then the, somehow, because the algorithms are all spinning, they all remember what you pushed. You know, you just push it. I only pushed it for a second. And it's like, <laughs> next thing you know, it's following you for the rest of your life. And it's there in the deep web. You know, anyone wants to look, it's like, wow, look at that. So it, similarly, that's our existence in the material world. Any buttons we push... It, they come back to us, and it's for a reason. It's for our refinement. Devotees come to this awareness that, that this place is booby-trapped. You know, be careful whatever kinds of things that you engage with because it's going to come, it has a consequence. Main thing is consequences. Think about the word consequence, sequence. Sequence means one thing follows another. Consequence means I do this, and here's what's going to happen. It's an algorithm. The material world, prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sar. It's a machine, Krishna says. So watch out. And Prahlad says, don't get your finger stuck in the machine. In fact, he talks about his own fear. He says, yes, I'm a devotee, but I'm afraid of Vishnu Maya. He says, it's like a big grinding wheel machine. And you stick your finger back in, and you let me just try it one more time. I think, but, and next thing you know, your finger goes in, your hand, you get ground up again in the material world. Consequence. So devotees become very aware. What are the consequences? So they uh, keep their minds focused on topics that are conducive, and they're careful which buttons they push. Yes. Thank you very much for the very nice class. I was just thinking about the point that you made. Thank you for opening mere woods to the world.
разобьет. I told Maharaj this morning, he's very pleased with you, by the way. Just so you know. Hare Krishna. It was you and Maharaj who opened it up. <laughs> We're just following. Prabhupada opened it up. He walked there. Shamasundar would take him there. Prabhupada walked through Mere Woods. So, this is, anyway, it's a portal. So, I was just appreciating the point that you made initially about uh, that how Krishna makes uh, everything look tidy. Although initially it may not be visible to us. But he makes it look tidy. And another uh, point about which you were mentioning about uh, how the senses are like the highwaymen robbers. Yes. So I was just, uh, I had a question with respect to that. In the fifth canto, in one of the purpose, Prabhupada mentions that uh, the best way to deal with the mind is to neglect it. Can you elaborate a little more about that? Yes, uh, tender loving neglect. Is it just the way I'm used to neglecting important work? I know I'm supposed to, you know, answer an email or whatever, but my mind is expert at neglecting. It's like, what do I do? Something else, anything but that. <laughs> so just transfer that same energy, put it in a bottle, and bring it over and apply it to when the senses come calling. It's like uh, Haridas Thakur showed the way. A prostitute showed up. He's doing his sadhana. And prostitutes there said, Hi, by the way. And, and he said, sure, no problem. Be right with you. you know. But he neglected her. He kept chanting his japa. And so, you know, three days later, uh, by hanging out there, she became a devotee. So three days later, urges come and they advertise. They have a little sign that says, I'll be here forever. But they never stay around. They, they can't handle it when you, when you uh, don't pay attention to them. You have to not pay attention to them. Don't give them energy. We had this uh, guru, Satyadev Prabhu and I, special guru we had in our lives. As in the early days when we go to Japan together, and um, we had to travel from uh, uh, Osaka to Takayama, which way up in the mountains, about a five-hour drive. And every time uh, a Bhaicharan would pick us up, uh, and Krishna Priya, they had the son who was just a little kid, and he was the most annoying kid we've ever met. And, uh, and so we had to ride in the van with him. And he used to just, we'd be trying to hear him chant in the van, and he'd be trying to interrupt us and uh, uh, tease us. And then, uh, you know, after three, three years in a row, then we had this revelation about how if, if you don't give him any energy, he starts to get bored and look somewhere else somebody else to annoy. And so we, start, we changed his name, we called him Guruji, because <laughs> he was teaching us this valuable lesson of neglect. And um, so, uh, you know, when these things come up in our life, don't give them so much energy. Turn your attention to your service and say, yeah, I know you're there, but uh, I'm busy. You know, be busy, make sure you got a, a valid excuse. Otherwise, says, you're not busy, you know, I've seen you hanging out, so uh, why not this too? So keep yourself busy, make sure that when you wake up, you hit the ground running and you keep going throughout the day. And if you're going to neglect them, make sure you lock the cage too, because otherwise they'll get out. That unlocking of the cage, that metaphor is really, in, in our heart we say, oh, it's not that bad, you know, it's okay. And if you, you know... Devotees are not devoid of sense gratification. It's that we're not jnanis. We don't reject the world. We transfer the same energy that we're using in the material world uh, to Krishna, to Krishna's devotees. Devotees have fun. They have social life. So we should make sure that we have all those things, that we're, we're connected with devotees in a fun way. You have to, you know, ha have a place, Hare Krishna, We'd like to welcome Bhima Karma Prabhu again back to ISV. I have to say, he's, uh, I mean, he grew up in the Krishna consciousness movement. He has such a, uh, a wonderful attitude about life. Uh, I really appreciate 
I'm getting to know him better. So we feel very blessed he's here. And he's, a, he's got a deep love for, uh, for Kirtan and uh, has learned in a, a very um, proper traditional Vaishnav way how to bring the Kirtan out so that um, it pleases Krishna in the best way. So today he's going to be giving seminars here for kids and uh, also for adults, for everybody. And, um, yeah, we're very appreciative that you came here. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Please make this your home away from home. So, uh, finally, uh, we have the, the appearance of Balaram and Lord Krishna coming up. This is our great fortune. That um, in the purport today, Prabhupada mentioned that people don't have a proper, proper object of worship. They don't have a place to actually put their minds where they'll feel satisfied. And they're looking over and over again for the various uh, objects that they can look at. And nothing satisfies them. There's no uh, TV show. There's no movie. There's no uh, object you can buy uh, that will satisfy you. But if you think about, hear about, and remember Krishna and Balaram, and how they appeared. Go into the details of how and why they appeared. Bhagavatam. Hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. That will satisfy the mind and the heart. And that's legal sense gratification. That's real sense gratification. Become enchanted with the way in which Krishna easily killed these various wizards who came into his life. Be enchanted by the way Krishna plays with his friends and how uh, when Krishna, when Balaram smashes the head of Pralambasura, a profuse amount of blood comes out. That should satisfy the need for uh, seeing uh, horrible things, like people along the freeway, they want to stop. If they see a little fender bender, what to speak of somebody got really smashed up. Everyone's like, whoa! That there's a desire in the heart to see stuff. We're not Ghanis. We can't detach ourselves from the world. Try driving down the road if there's an accident on the right, on the right side and not looking. <laughs> you can't do it. It's impossible. You can't just drive by. And if you do, all the way home you'd be thinking, darn, I should have looked. <laughs> because that's our nature. We want this. And it's only available in a way that's satisfying and actually nourishing through Krishna's pastimes in the Bhagavatam. So that's why when Balaram's appearance day comes, when Krishna's appearance day, the devotees are jumping for joy because we're saved. We have a place to invest our love, our energy, our attention, to, to remember details. And all these things, actually, uh, Krishna says, uh, just by remembering them, uh, your heart becomes purified. Srinvatam Svakata Krishna, Sutta Goswami. Punya Shravana Kirtana. In and of itself, it's pious. So here's where to put all your attention so that when other paltry uh, desires come up, then you have the wherewithal to neglect them. And just say, you wait later, some other time, some other lifetime, and then you sneak out the door. Uh, when you leave this world, and he goes, like, you guys just stay there, I'm out of here for good. No more to do with you. So that's the, our, our great benediction, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and hearing the pastimes of Krishna and Balaram, and having kirtan uh, constantly to uh, glorify the, the Lord and his names and so forth. Then we'll feel satisfied, and at the end of this life, by Lord Chaitanya's mercy, no matter what other little um, dis so-called discrepancies are there, He'll take us home back to Godhead. Go pray, Manande Haribo.